Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for an opportunity again to hear your word. I ask, O oh Lord, that you teach us. Open my mouth so I can speak boldly your words. And the entrance of your word give it light. Uh, bring it light. I pray, Lord, your, your, the light of your word will shine upon our lives and give us the wisdom to do your words, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, the Bible says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. The Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. The title of my sermon this morning is, Prepare the way for the Lord. Prepare the way for the Lord. Now, John is one of the most common names here in America, uh, the name John, you know, be, uh, a lot of people answer the name John. In fact, it's so common that the official or legal name for someone that is nameless <laughs> is John Doe. So that's how common John is. But what does John remind you of? What when you, when you hear the name John, what does it remind you of? Open to Isaiah chapter 40. For some, it will remind them of a relative or a friend um, or a colleague or something like that. But for many, um, it reminds you of two characters in the Bible, being John the Baptist and John the Beloved. Uh, John the Beloved being, you know, a disciple of Jesus Christ. Um, John the Baptist is the first man in the Bible to bear the name John, at least is the first mention of the name John, uh, and that is John the Baptist. And let's examine his ministry and his calling. Remember, the title of this sermon is Prepare the Way for the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, Isaiah 40, verse 3, the Bible says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God, every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. So what's the Bible saying? This is the, the first, the ministry of John as prophesied by Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied the ministry of John to prepare the way for the Lord. And what does that mean? He gave it in a parable make, saying, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Make straight in the desert. If you know anything about the desert, which is a wilderness, <laughs> There's not like a highway going there. I mean, you don't ride horses with chariots there in the desert or in the wilderness. I mean, you can have sinking sand or, or hills, valleys, rough places. It's just a rough terrain. And so people walk through the desert to get to places. So this is an analogy that is used that the people of that day understand. But us, you know, we, we just see roads everywhere. <laughs> so when we're going anywhere, it's all smooth, sidewalks done. In fact, if it snows, your, the homeowner is legally responsible to clear the sidewalk because if you slip and fall, you sue them. <laughs> So this analogy might not, you know, hit us as hard, but I want to make it clear to us that it's, it was a rough way and Bible, God is saying we should prepare the way for the Lord. So uh, John the Baptist, his ministry, which was foretold by Isaiah, even in Malachi as we read, but let's go Isaiah first, was foretold to make straight a highway, not just a path for someone to walk. A highway that means is a major road people walk there people move chariots and horses there you see what I mean so make it so major that it's common so it's a common road so that he can reach as many people as possible and move fast make it easy for God to get where he's going to do what he needs to do so we should prepare ye the way for the Lord so how did he explain it in, uh, uh, in this parable so the highway is the straightest way, is the easiest and the quickest way. It helps build momentum. You know, in a drag race, that's talking about a car race, or a hundred meter sprint race, you know, it's straight, it's leveled, no potholes, nothing, your lanes are there. That is what God is saying, that we should make a way like that so that uh, the runner, he that's using the way, would use it easily. 
And what did he say? The valleys shall be exalted. Valleys are the deeps, you know, next to the mountains. So exalted means they'll be filled up. You use in different places in the Bible, you know, fill the valleys, level the mountains and the hills. That's what he's talking about. So he's trying to make a way straight. So exalt the valleys, level the mountains and the hills. The crooked paths make them straight. So the ways that are crooked, he wants the road straight. And this straight is actually straight as, as opposed to crooked. You know, there's the G there, you know, G-I-G-H-T. So it's talking about straight. And the rough places make smooth. So rough road, make it smooth. No potholes like Pennsylvania road should be like more like Philadelphia, I say Philadelphia, Florida, Ohio. Oh man, I was in, I traveled to Ohio a few years back and their roads 80 miles an hour. That's just like a, my dream road. Anyway. <laughs> Open to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. So 80 miles per hour highway. Highway where you look all the way down. And then you can see if your car can finish a speedometer, you know? Uh, yeah, you can just try it out. But if the cops get you, you don't say, Pastor Tori, do that. Um, Isaiah, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 3. So Isaiah is an interesting book. We just looked at what Isaiah said. Isaiah, there are 66 chapters in Isaiah. And the entire book is, symbolic, uh, is symbolical uh, because it represents or re reflects Every chapter in Isaiah reflects every book in the Bible. It, it's very interesting about Isaiah. So, uh, Isaiah chapter 40, guess what book it reflects? There are 39 books in the Old Testament. So, what's the 40th book? Matthew. So, Isaiah chapter 40 represents or reflects Matthew. And you can read through Isaiah yeah, and check what I'm saying. But it's pretty, you know, solid, dot on. So, in the beginning of uh, uh, Matthew... Uh, Isaiah chapter 40 what are we talking about? the coming of the Lord preparing the way for the Lord right? so look at Matthew chapter 3 Matthew chapter 3 look at verse 1 the Bible says in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand for this is what sorry for this is that for this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, that is Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan confessing their sin. So what was John? Uh, what was John? John was the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare ye the way. And he said that about himself in John chapter 1 verse 23 when they asked John, they said John so are you the Messiah? Are you the prophet Isaiah? Are you, what are you? He said I am the voice. <laughs> so John is was the voice and God is telling saying that we should prepare the way for the Lord it's not just for his first coming even now after his first coming so what are we supposed to be we are supposed to be the voice open to first Kings chapter 17 this shows you the power and the might of our voice what our voice represents don't think oh we're just talking or we're just saying you know preaching is what the voice right going so winning is the voice moses was sent to pharaoh to be the voice that's what moses was sent to pharaoh to be then moses was like oh but what if they don't believe me what if they don't say what then god said okay what do you have in your hand it's not like god said oh i want you to go and just start showing signs and wonders i want you to go and tell pharaoh to let my people go he was a voice. You're supposed to be the voice to prepare the way for the Lord so that God can do what he needs to do. Amen? So, um, uh, and that's to Pharaoh. Moses also was a voice for the children of Israel because he gave the laws of God. The children of Israel did not want to hear the voice of God. They were like, oh, it's too terrible for us. So Moses was the voice to the children of Israel. So um, Jeremiah also was a voice. God touched his mouth, right? God had touched his lips. And God gave, put his words in him. So he was a voice to the nation of uh, Judea, Judah and to all nations, all kingdoms of the world. He spread uh, the gospel, to the words that God wanted him to spread. Um, Elijah was the voice that came from nowhere. I told you to open to 1 Kings chapter 17, look at verse 1. The Bible says, And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, 
as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. So he was the voice of God. Elisha, uh, sorry, Elijah came from nowhere. No one till date knows Elijah's father. Who, who is Elijah? No one knows his father. Oh, he was of uh, the inhabitants of Gilead. Uh, people could have just come in and joined Israel. <laughs> Elijah might have been, I don't know, <laughs> from another country, tribe, anything. I believe he was Israelite. But I'm just trying to tell you that he just came from nowhere and it was the voice. <laughs> it was the voice of God to Ahab. Because God wants you to use the voice. Um, John said, I am the voice. The apostles were called to be the voice. They were witnesses. Open to Acts chapter 22. They were witnesses of his resurrection. You know? Uh, so God wanted them to go and speak. Say. What did Peter say? I cannot but say, speak the things that I've seen and heard. Right? Um, even Paul was called to be the voice. In Acts chapter 22 verse 11, the Bible says, And when I could not see for the glory of the light. This is Paul giving the story of how he got converted. How he got saved. He says, And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me I came to Damascus and one Ananias a devout man according to the law having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there came unto me and stood and said unto me brother Saul receive thy sight and the same hour I looked up upon him and he said the God of our fathers has chosen thee that thou shouldest know his will and see that just one and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth look at verse 15 for Thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. That's his, that was his mission. To be the voice. To be the voice of God. Great men of God. I mean, I could keep going examples upon examples. I am the voice. Great men of God were voices of God, were speaking for God. In uh, First Peter, sorry, Second Peter, chapter one, verse twenty-one. You don't have to open it. I just quote it. Bible says, "For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake." As they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God is looking for the voice. In Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 30. The Bible says. And I sought for a man among them. That should make up the hedge. And stand in the gap before me for the land. That I should not destroy it. But I found none. Nobody wants to stand and speak. In the days that iniquity was abounding. And the love of many were waxing cold. And the wicked were prospering. The righteous hid themselves. They didn't want to talk. Oh, judge not, judge not. Oh, hey, there are two men getting married in your community. What do you do? You keep quiet and you hide yourself. And God is looking for a voice. This is wrong. We shouldn't be doing this. I mean, this, this does not help the society. No. <laughs> no one is talking. God is looking for a voice. Um, to prepare the way for the Lord. It's not like, okay, when you say that, then everything just changes. But you say that, then you're preparing the way for God so that God can walk. But if you don't prepare the way for the Lord, then destruction is going to come. That, because that's what men understand. That's what Israel understood. Many times they sin, destruction comes. They sin. In fact, God just left those people, the Philistines. <laughs> Let me just use them, use these people to teach you guys a lesson. Every time you sin, you, you go on that slavery, you go on that bondage. Um, Open to Colossians chapter 1. So you and I are the voice. In case you didn't get the message. Um, <laughs> we are the voice of the Lord for this generation. We have the great commission. Go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. Right? So we are, that's what God sent us to do. I mean, he was leaving and that's the last thing he said. You know, that's the last thing he was saying. So um, in Colossians chapter 1 verse 25. Colossians chapter 1. I read from verse 25. The Bible says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the, myst even the mystery which had been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Look at verse 28. Whom we preach. 
You see that? So we're preaching Jesus. We are the voice. Whom we preach, this is what we do. Not just what the apostles did. This is what we all do. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Do you see, are they forcing anybody? Are they literally manhandling people and saying, hey, you must do this. Hey, you, you must. Hey, I have. No, no, no. All we're doing is talking. It's a voice. We're warning every man. We're teaching every man in all wisdom. That's what we're doing. <laughs> so it, it's the power of your voice is what God wants. The Bible goes on saying, verse 29, Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his walking, which walketh in me mightily. So if you let God use you, then he can walk through you to change people's lives, to win souls. See, uh, you can cause people to go to heaven or hell. It's up to you if you use your voice. You have that power. Amen? Look at Luke chapter 1. We're still talking about prepare ye the way for the Lord. Prepare ye the way for the Lord. Uh, a further description of John's ministry, John the Baptist, we see it in Luke chapter 1, what the angel told Zacharias. So let's look at what the angel told Zacharias about his son. I'll take, pick up the story from verse 11. Luke chapter 1, verse 11. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. And the angel said unto him, Fear Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit sorry and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers of the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord so that's packed up right there is, is a lot and um, I'm going to look at four points out of what uh, he said what the angel said to Sorry, my thing just acted up. Look at four points of what the angel said to Zacharias. Uh, open to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. So the four main points to prepare the way for the Lord from what we learned from Luke chapter 1. Number one, die to the flesh. Die to the flesh. You want to prepare the way for the Lord, then learn to die to the flesh. Because he said he will not drink wine, nor strong drink. Now, I'm not saying that if you drink wine, I mean, when I say wine, now I'm talking about fruit juice. Now, strong drink is alcohol. We already know that's a sin. Um, uh, we should not, he, uh, he did not drink wine, nor strong drink. What the Bible is trying to say is he didn't, no pleasures of the world. In fact, the Bible says what we read in Matthew, that his food was locust and wild honey. So he wasn't enjoying pleasures of wine. I know fruit juice is readily available right now, <laughs> but back then it was for rich folks. Yeah, people actually step on the juice and you know bring out the juice, and not just juice of any fruit. It was the the vine, the juice from the vine. So having a vineyard was you know expensive. Um, so he, he didn't have pleasures of this world, the pleasures of this life. He just ate basic necessities, locust and wild honey. Now, unless I'm a farmer, I don't know if locust is going to be my main, <laughs> my main source of nutrients, but that's what he ate. Um, look at Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. The Bible says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwells in you. And remember, if you're saved, the spirit of God dwells in you. And the Bible is saying you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, because you are saved, right? Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That means if the Spirit of God is not dwelling in you, guess what? You're not saved. You're not of Christ. You're not a child of God. So what? In another word, he's trying to say the Spirit of God is dwelling in you. If not, you're not saved. That's what that verse is saying. Verse 10. 
And if Christ being you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit which that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors to the flesh to live, sorry, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. That's what I'm talking about. Mortifying the deeds of the body. So that you can live, so that you can be led by the Spirit of God, so that God can do the work amongst His people. God wants us to prepare the way. So number one, die to flesh, so that you can be used. So you can be a disciple of God. So you can go so with it. Parable of the sower, right? You have to completely die, get fertilized in good soil. You're not choked by the pleasures of this world. You have a good, solid foundation in the Lord. Because Jesus was saying, hey, if I'm in you, if you're in me and my words abide in you. Right? Then, whatsoever has the Father in my name, I'll give it to you. So, he wants you to abide in him, be deeply rooted in him, not in stony places. So, get yourself in a good church, read your Bible every day. Then, don't get choked by the pleasures of this world, and you find yourself in a good soil. And you bring forth fruit. Then God can use you. Number two, be filled with the Holy Ghost. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. There's a difference between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us and the coming of the Holy Ghost upon us. That, has, that is throughout the whole Bible. The indwelling came with the new covenant. And I've explained this before. But be filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's what Jesus was talking about in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. When he said, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in, Ju in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. That's why it's telling the disciples but the disciples had already received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit but Jesus was telling them that the coming of the Holy Ghost upon them is at hand you know soon and when they have the Holy Ghost come upon them then they were able to do mighty things for the Lord they were able to speak boldly you know all of that um, how, where do we see that in the story the Bible says for John the Baptist from his mother's womb he was filled with the Holy Ghost <laughs> The Holy Ghost came upon him from his mother's womb. Hence, when Mary came, Elizabeth said, My baby leaped within me. Wow. Because, you know, um, what do you have? I say slang, but never mind. <laughs> you know, power, respect, power, you know. <laughs> because it's the same spirit, right? It's the same spirit. And the Holy Spirit, uh, he knows that that is God. Mm -hmm. Amen. So the Holy Ghost was upon him, and he, he, the baby leaped. It is just wonderful. And that's how Elizabeth knew that she was carrying uh, the blessed, you know, God, basically. Uh, because they were waiting for the Messiah. All right. Um, so he was filled. Uh, understand. Now, I said be filled with the Holy Ghost. Understand that John the Baptist, filled from his mother's womb with the Holy Ghost, performed no miracle. So I'm not saying, ah, you feel the Holy Ghost, you're going to be doing all these mighty things and doing miracles and healing the sick and all of that. Did God need that to prepare the way for him? No. Because John the Baptist, the greatest prophet, according to Jesus, born of a woman, performed no miracles. But he won a lot of souls. He prepared the path for Jesus. I mean, you think, if someone is going to prepare the path for Jesus, I mean, you need someone doing all these great miracles, so people will be like, oh, the truth. Who do you say is Jesus again? You know, right? You need signs and wonders and all these great things. No, but it was his words. Just his voice God needed to prepare the path. You have what you need to prepare the path for Jesus. In those days, it was, it was bad. It was horrible. I mean, it was, it was compared to as a desert. I mean, it's even worse right now. Let me not. <laughs> so it was compared to as a desert, making a highway in the desert. That's how difficult it was to make a way for the Lord. So but all God wanted was his voice. So this power to be the voice and to do all God requires, we have it filled with the Holy Ghost. Ask God to give you the Holy Ghost. You read your Bible, and when the time, see, to the prepared uh, uh, person, there's work to do. If you say, "Oh, I, I don't know, I'm looking for work to do," are you, what are you prepared for? What can you do? <laughs> Prepare yourself, and work will come. That's just, that's just as simple as it is. But if you're not prepared, you, you've not read your Bible, you've not done. What is the Holy Spirit going to remind you of? 
you know God says hey don't prepare beforehand what you will say before magistrate because they've already read the Bible it's not saying don't read at all forever just come without reading your Bible no they've read their Bible they're doing what God wants them to do then when that time comes the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they'll speak not of themselves but of God see still their voices number three I'm not going to spend so much time here, but it's be a soul winner. Be a soul winner. Bible says uh, concerning John, for he shall be great, and, he sh and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. So he, he's, um, he was a soul winner. How do I know he was a soul winner? Because he baptized them. What is the requirement for baptism? <laughs> do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you put... Don't read the false Bibles that remove that verse. I think it's uh, Acts 8.37. No, no, they remove that verse. So, do you believe in Jesus? I believe. And they remove that verse. I say, oh, what's holding us? Let's get baptized. No, to be baptized, you have to believe in Jesus first. So that means, he was a soul winner. He was in the Great Commission. He was going to the world. He was preaching the gospel. And many people were saved because multitudes were baptized. And how again do I know? Because when the Pharisees came for baptism, he's like, whoa, you, you vipers. You generation of vipers. He was not going to baptize them because he knows they're not saved. Right. You see that? So it's not just going to, oh, let me just baptize everybody. Yeah, yeah, well, let's prepare for the Lord. So let's prepare for the Lord. Oh, let's just, all the Sodomites, everybody, just enter the church. As, as long as they're in church, hey, pastor, they, they're, they're, at least they're coming to church. I mean, let's help everybody. Let's let everybody just come to church. No! This is the house of the Lord. So, we're not going to allow the generation of vipers, right? The, the people that are harming other people, yes, they're generation of vipers too. I mean, leave them with your child and you know. You, I would rather leave a snake with, with my child than one of them. At least the snake will bite them. My child will know, okay, they are bitten by a snake, we're going to remove the poison. If they die, they die. Than to be molested and like, in fact, why am I even digressing? Let me focus. Um, number four, so that's number three, be a soul winner. What's number one? Number one, die to the flesh. Number two, be filled with the Holy Ghost. Number three, be a soul winner. Number four, restore the brethren. Restore the brethren. This is how you prepare the way for the Lord. Open to Ephesians chapter six. Now, this part of the Great Commission also, you know, because the Bible says you should make disciples, right? After baptizing them, make disciples of them. So, um, how do you restore the brethren? You turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. That is what John the Baptist did. He said that he turned the hearts of fathers to their children. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, for our generation, let's start off with telling fathers to have children. How about that? You know, you guys, you just need to have children. Because men are like, you know, they don't want to have children. Men go in their own way, right? Because of the women. <laughs> Destroying the society. You know, the feminism movement, so-called feminism movement, but it's just women destruction movement, that's what I call it. Because they're destroying themselves, right? So, my body, my choice. So, a man trying to have a baby, but a woman owns everything. <laughs> so, anything the woman says, that's what goes. Oh, I want my son to be born. I want my daughter to be born. No, I'm not going to carry that baby. Or you're thinking you're going to have a baby, but a woman is doing something else. You know, you're not going to be able to have a baby. So, the society is just messed up. So, after we pass that hump anyway, for those that have the children, <laughs> or at least let them desire to have the children, for the next generation. It's for the next generation. Let's think about that. Because um, uh, the next generation can do even more exploits for the Lord. Right? Just like Israel and the generation of Israel that came out of the wilderness, they did great things. They fought Jericho. They believed in the Lord their God. Throughout the days of Joshua, they've worshipped and followed only God. But when their hearts turned to their children. So, raising the next generation, we need the hearts of fathers to turn to their children to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of who? Fox News? Or what they say, how to raise your child. Oh, don't don't spank them. Don't talk to them harshly. Just positive reinforcements. There you go. Have you heard that before? Positive re anything your child does, they, you all you have to say is a positive reinforcement. This is what they teach in the world. So your child breaks a plate. You see, breaking plates. I don't even know how you make that positive. <laughs> 
I, I mean, this stuff, you can't teach it, man. I mean, you can't, you can't make this stuff up. I don't know how you say that because I'm not wired that way. But you say, uh, it's, it's just, don't break, uh, no, you, can't, you can't say don't break the plate. I mean, you have to say, I don't know how to do <laughs> Think of something nicer. Oh, stop heat. Uh, you know, you can stress your energy uh, or you make give them karate classes or something to stress out, make their, bring out their stress. I mean, these are little children. All they need is a rod on their back. Right. And everything is fine. That's all they need. You know, the rod will save him from hell. Because you love the child. But they think love is the other way around. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is the admonition of the Lord. So go and read your Bible. What did God say? How did God say you should handle your child? That's exactly what you should do. Now when you do it, then you're turning the hearts of fathers back to their children. <laughs> and be times and early. So you turn and they'll bring up their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. For example, I'm sitting down here. If my son is not singing the hymns, Oh, I'm, I'm going to make sure he sings that hymn. Open the Bible, you know, sing out, all of that. Because you have to start now and early. Um, so that's one. Turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. So this is making disciples, as I said. We're talking about saved people. Because if they are not saved, how will you be turning the heart of fathers to their children in the admonition of the Lord? That's, that's not going to happen. Because they don't believe in the Lord. So for the same people, they are still disobedient. They are not using the wisdom of the just. Open to James chapter 3. Now, the wisdom of the just is the wisdom from above. The just here means saved. Wisdom of the just. Because to be justified is not by works, not by deeds of the law, but it's by grace through faith. Right? Then you're justified in the sight of God. Hey, but to be justified in the sight of men, they need to see your works. Right? right. You're aware if you can go to glory in the sight of men. You know, because faith without works is dead. I can't see it. But God can see it. Because you, uh, you're justified in his sight. All right. James chapter 3. So the wisdom of the just. What, what kind of, uh, you say, how we turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Before you read chapter 3, in James 1, 5, Bible says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, sorry, ask of God, that give it to all men, liberally, and upbraid it not, and it shall be given him. So it's not like, okay, this wisdom is, you have to be saved for like three decades, then you have raised children, before you have this wisdom. No, God is, is he wants to just give it out. Amen. It's like it's like someone's asking you for air. I don't know. You just like, have air. You know, <laughs> like that's that's how much God wants to give us this wisdom. So it's not some strange hard to get thing. It's, it's your heart. It's your heart, right? Or are you trying to get wisdom so you can be proud or so you can sh bring other people down or, or, or mislead people or uh, uh, look for preeminence among the brethren or have all this wisdom? You no, know, just ask God for this wisdom and read your Bible and God's going to speak to you. God's going to give you the wisdom. Amen? Amen. So look at James chapter 3. So from the, uh, turn the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. James chapter 3, I read from verse 13. The Bible says, who is, wise, sorry, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him shew out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your heart, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descended not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy so God is trying to tell us hey if you're wise if you're endued with knowledge show it with your good conversation right so we're turning this because if you're not showing it then you're disobedient to the wisdom of the just so show your, it with your works I want to see the works Yes, you're saved. Right. But turn to the, uh, uh, to the wisdom of the just. Stop being disobedient and not obeying what the Bible is saying. I want to see the works. Because, uh, but if there's envy, there's strife, or, uh, uh, don't glory. Don't think, oh yeah, I'm right with the Lord. You're not. Don't glory in yourself. Don't lie against the truth. Amen? This wisdom that you have is not from above. Oh, you think you're smart. That's the thing. Uh, I'll do this for the Lord. I'll do this. I'll do that. Remember what I preached last, last Sunday? 
oh, I'll do all this and I'll get my rewards and stuff. You already made this deal with the Lord. At the end, you be like, oh, but how come I'm just getting this? Uh, is God unjust? Oh, I'll just do this and this and that. I know I'm going to heaven. I know I'll get some rewards as long as I'm not doing this and this and that. Those workers that started from the beginning, I mean, they worked hard. It's not like they were lazy about. They worked hard, but anything God gives you will be, will be more than you deserve. But don't look, uh, don't have an evil eye when other people that are working for the Lord, doing so much more, not thinking they are wise in their own conceit. Right? Working for the Lord will get, uh, that started even late, later before you, will get so much more uh, than you. But let's come back here. So, um, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. And since I saw this, you know, open my eyes to so many things. It's first pure. You cannot say, oh, let's just make peace. Because that's the word. That's the, the, the word that's going on in this world. Or in, in amongst religions. Let's put it that way. They say, why is your religion? Why is it that what you believe? When you read the Bible, all you see is hate, hate, hate. Why can't you make peace? I mean, is God not the prince of peace? I mean, like, when you see people misuse the Bible, don't even know what peace, making, reconciling man with God. They don't know anything. And to them, when you just see peace, it's just... Everybody's all friends. We're all friends. Well, we're all together. We're serving the same God. One religion. One God. One everything. With all these people. Don't, don't make confederacy with them, as the Bible says. Don't join with them. Because the wisdom from above is first pure. Purity. Amen. And God has given us the standards in the Bible. For us to come together and be peaceful and all of that. What are those standards? Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Right? Let's start off with that one. <laughs> because... What has light to do with darkness? What has Christ to do with Belial? Right? Then you move on for those that are saved. What uh, coming into the church? What are the standards for that? Right? So, so you go on and on from there. So purity first, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. Right? Full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. All right. Over to James chapter 5. So we are to prepare the way for the Lord even now. As John came in the spirit of Elijah, God is challenging us and telling us we have the Holy Spirit too. We have the Holy Spirit put upon us. So John came in the spirit of Elijah. That is, you know, the same spirit that Elijah had. That is type of spirit, type of personality and all of that. But we, but the Holy Spirit is one walking through him. Right? It's the Holy Spirit that's walking through him. We have the Holy Spirit even with our own spirits. We are walking through us to do the will of God. Uh, uh, Bible says in James chapter 5 verse 16. James chapter 5 verse 16. It says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual a fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So you see how this starts off, this passage starts off with helping one another. Because one way to prepare the way for the Lord is starting up here in the church. We're supposed to help one another, lift one another up, strengthen ourselves. Because one person going out so winning, two people going out so winning, is not the same as eight people, ten people going out so winning. You see that? So when we help one another, we can do a whole lot more for the Lord. We can prepare the way for the Lord. That's what God, God wants to do His work. He wants to do great things. But He needs us to make the way. Make a highway in the wilderness for Him. So, let's help ourselves. Let's help ourselves. And look, at that's what the Bible is saying at the end of James. You know, James is talking about, you know, what is true religion, right? Yeah. <laughs> Don't, like, faith without works is dead. It's encouraging the brethren. So, so confess your faults one to another. This is not the same thing like going to the Catholic priest's confession booth and saying, uh, how do they say it again? Father, I've sinned. Uh, it's, it's, been, it's been three weeks before, since my last confession. Uh, <laughs> I was once a Catholic, so I know all these things. Um, so confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth, availeth much. Verse 17. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Remember I told you Elijah came out from nowhere. <laughs> and he just said, hey, there's not going to be rain because of your iniquities, because of your sin. So it was just a voice, right? So God 
God is telling us, hey, we can just say things and, you know, pray concerning it. And the, fervent, uh, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So, God is challenging us through, uh, with the story of Elijah. The Bible goes on to say, And he prayed again, and heaven and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Verse 19, Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, sorry, if any of you do err from the truth, and one converts him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sins. You see that? So any of you, brethren, you see that? He's talking about the brethren, the same. See, if one of us are erring from the truth, we're doing, following a false doctrine, a wrong thing, we're believing something wrong, and one of us go and correct that brethren, because he's disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Right? So, you save a soul from death. I said, but Pastor, I thought we are already saved. Yeah, you're saved from hell. But God can kill you if you continue living in sin. You see what I mean? Continue living in sin. Continue doing abominable things. Being wicked. Or, or, I mean, if you're not walking in the wisdom of the just, God can kill you. Because wisdom from above is first pure. God wants purity. Amen? So, you convert a sinner from the error of his way. And save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Because God is just going to forgive the person and move on. Clean slate. That's how God is. I mean, we can't understand his ways. As high as the heavens from the earth, as far as the east is from the west. That's how much his love is. Amen? So as he walked through Elijah, he can walk through us. Open to Galatians chapter 6. He can walk through us. We should pray one for another. And we should correct our doctrinal errors. Oh, this is what pastor is saying. This is what the church is saying. Hey, let's talk to one another. Hey, what do you think about this? This is what I believe. Let's help ourselves, right? Now, having said that, what did Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 say? Galatians 6 verse 1 says, Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault. Remember, it says, confess your fault one to another. Written by God. Same spirit. But through James. The, the, the brother of Jesus Christ. Now, through Paul, what is he saying? Same spirit talking. He says, If brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So, God is trying to say, hey, your spiritual, be, when I say spiritual, it doesn't mean, remember, it's not earthly, sensual, and what is that again? Earthly and devilish, there you are, I forget that one. <laughs> earthly, sensual, and devilish. This spiritual means you have the word of God in you. You know the truth. You see where he's mistaken in a fault, or, sorry, overtaken in a fault. Maybe he even came to confess the fault to you. Because many times, hey, you might, people might not be able to come up to the pastor and tell the pastor everything because like, he's probably going to preach about it next week. <laughs> so I'm not telling the pastor that. Hey, I'm not going to do that, obviously. I have my sermons mostly prepared already, pre-prepared. Uh, I have know what I'm talking about and stuff. But even if I preach about what you're doing, hey, you should thank God I'm even preaching about it. Sometimes I read the Bible, I study it, and I'm like giving you, you know, what the Bible says concerning it. Amen? You should thank God for that. But... Uh, obviously, I <laughs> I'll do things right, but but uh, people might not be able to come up, and they'll come to you and uh, to the brethren in the church and ask one another. So you that are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, not looking down on them and saying I know one of you. Uh, you know, just in spirit of meekness. Hey, and you watch yourself because if not, you too will be tempted and be like, oh, maybe you're right. Maybe we don't have to come to church three times in a week. I mean, we've been doing it two times in a week. Did God send us to hell? Did he kill us? No. So, I mean, three times a week, well, maybe you're right. But <laughs> as, as long as the church doors are open, hey, God is calling you to come. The more, even as you see the day approaching, right? Um, so, this is one important aspect of preparing the way for the Lord. Your brother, and you see, your brother that you encourage today might go on to do great things for the Lord. Even more than you ever thought of doing. And Ananias took Paul in, right? And what happened? And helped him. And Paul became who we know Paul as. You know, Saul became Paul, right? Open to Matthew chapter 24. As John prepared the way for the Lord in the first coming of Christ, in the first coming of Christ, John prepared the way of the Lord. We are to prepare the way for the Lord's second coming. Yes. 
Yes, I said that. We're supposed to spread the way for the Lord's second coming. We're supposed to do all these things and prepare his, the way. See, um, now, uh, how do I put this? Especially in this generation, in this time that we're living in, we're supposed to prepare the way so that God can do many things, the th uh, great things in this, in this world, He'll get people saved because God is delaying uh, because He wants a lot of people saved. Now, I'm not saying we're the ones delaying it. No matter, even if John did what he did or didn't do what he did, Jesus was going to come, right? And Jesus was going to, at that appointed time, everything was already planned out. God knew when it was happening. But God has given us that calling. Let's not, let's not be like the Jews, right? Like the Israelites, that God had to take the kingdom away from them and give it to another nation bearing the fruits, right? That can bear fruits. So let God not take that from you and give it to somebody else and say, hey, see, if these people don't praise me, even these stones <laughs> shall praise me, right? Look at Matthew 24, verse 14. Matthew 24, verse 14. The Bible says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of dissolution spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso read it, let him understand. I want to give us a context. So Jesus said, excuse me, that the, that the gospel is going to be preached to all the world, then shall the end come. You see that? So God is calling upon us to prepare the way for him to come. Like for the second coming. As again, I'm not saying we are delaying the rapture. Don't get me wrong. Open to Daniel chapter 11. Let's go to Daniel. The preaching of the gospel only happens during persecutions because we know at that time there's going to be a lot of persecutions. When the saints are being persecuted, when the church is being persecuted, you will see the true believers stand and the ones that the wolf will take away, right? You know, the true believers will stand and there'll be a, a it's no more be a gray area anymore. It's either you are for God or you're not for God. There's no because many believers now are in the gray area because there's no persecution right well, if they start persecuting they say oh if you, if you if you believe in Jesus Christ if you think you know what the Bible says is right about sodomites and if you think all this then we're not hiring our job in your work all of a sudden people will be like um, it's either I have a job or I don't have a job you have to make a choice now that you are not forced to make that choice <laughs> so, you know, people are in the gray area, people are... But when you're being persecuted, very clearly persecuted, believers will stand, and when they stand, they have nothing else to do but to do, do more exploits yeah. for the Lord. So, when you're being persecuted, when your family is pressing down on you, when things are turning bad your way, just because you are in the Lord, what do I advise you to do? What does the Bible advise you to do? Go into the Lord even the more. Right? Oh, maybe you should attend church once a week. You start attending church twice a week. Oh, maybe you should read your Bible 15 minutes a day. You start reading your Bible 30 minutes a day. Do more. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. This is just a test. See, if you start going to church every, every week, maybe you don't know, so go to church every week. Maybe in a month, you go to church twice in a month. And then you now start going every week. The devil is going to try to get you not to go to church. <laughs> He's going to try in the beginning. But when he tries in the beginning, if you give in to it, then he's been successful. Then anytime you want to go to church more, he's going to stop you. He's going to give you all that problems. All, you know, family problems, these problems, that problems. Your car is going to break down every time. But if your car breaks down, you'll park the car there, call Uber and get to church. Devil will be like, this car breaking down thing is not working. So, because God's going to bless you again. To shock you. Maybe you get a brand new car because of that. <laughs> and devil's like, okay, I can't use the car breaking down thing. So what will I use? Because if I use anything, God is going to bless that thing at the end. Because that's how it works. That's how, so you just have to withstand it during that time and even dive deeper into the Lord. Because that was like, the more I'm pushing him out of the Lord, the more he's reading his Bibles even more, he's going to church even more. So maybe I should not disturb him. Let me just leave him alone. I mean, I know churches that they persecuted the churches so much. And I'm talking about Faithful World Baptist Church. Uh, they persecuted them so much that the county, the city said, Hey, let's stop talking about this Pastor Anderson guy. <laughs> because the more we talk about him, the more it's like it's, it's spreading what they call it bad, uh, bad news, or every news is good advertisement. I mean, you 
are like advertising the church. People are being added to the church. The church is growing. It's getting more and more. They just stopped. They stopped disturbing them. <laughs> now, it's, they are disturbing other people. <laughs> they, they don't want to put them in the news anymore. Nothing. So, when you're getting persecuted for the Lord, you're going to preach the gospel more. You're going to stand more for the Lord. And that's what you should do. Because you've already chosen one way. You've already lost that job. <laughs> you've already lost, lost your family. You've already lost all. Then how about you embrace the family of God? And just don't, don't be in the middle and say, Oh, I've lost my family. There's no, I, I have, I'm, I'm alone. You're not alone. If you forsake family for, my, for God, then guess what you have? Hundredfold brothers, hundredfold sisters, hundredfold mothers. You still have your one wife though. Amen? And you still have your one father, which is in heaven. <laughs> but you have the hundredfold brothers, sisters, and mothers. And houses. Amen? And houses. But are we going to use what God has provided for us? Or you want to be wise in your own conceit? Have the wisdom of God first. Then purify your life. Amen? Then peace, oneness, all those things will come in. You're there in Daniel chapter 11. Look at verse 31. Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. The Bible says, And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. Remember, that's what I was referring to. Whoso reader, let him understand. The solution that uh, Daniel spoke about, that Jesus said in Matthew 24. Verse 32. Let's keep going. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. Right? But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So we've been talking about the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to put that abomination, which is an idol, that make it desolate. Make it desolate means the, the fullness of the Gentiles have come and they are just, they are just going to come into Jerusalem and destroy Jerusalem. This is a sermon, another sermon for it, for it, uh, on its own. So it make it the land desolate, Judea, uh, Judea desolate, so everybody will be fleeing out of the place. And the Bible says that such that do wickedly against the covenant. So the covenant that God has made with us, that means people that are not obeying the laws of God, all that. Those people that do wickedly against the covenant, shall he corrupt by flatteries. You know, they will think, oh, he's the great Messiah, or this is the greatest leader, this Antichrist is so good. He will flatter them and he will corrupt all of them. But the Bible says, but they... Or, or, or those, or sorry, the people that do know their God, they shall, uh, uh, sorry, shall be strong and do exploits. So the people that know their God, those that know the covenant, are walking with God, love the Lord, know the Bible, the spiritual ones, they will be strong and do exploits. They will go so winning. They will be preaching at the end time. That's why the Bible says the gospel will be spread around the whole world. Then the end shall come. Because those that know their God shall be strong and do as well. Let's continue. Verse 33. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Pause there. You know, um, in Left Behind. Yes. In Left Behind. Or, anyway, before I was saved, what I understood about these times is that if you miss the rapture, right? Then you'll be like, oh, wow, everybody has disappeared. We have understanding. So they will not start setting up churches and you can die by your own blood. This is not what that is talking about. Amen. It's not for people that miss the rapture, then you instruct many. God's talking about during that great tribulation, right? Those that know their God, they will be strong and do exploits. Those that understand, they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Like the, like the, the men, the, the sons of Issachar. These are men that understood the times that they were in. You understand? Those men, they had wisdom because they understood the times they are in. There are many people, many believers in that time, they will understand the times that they are in and they will stand knowing, I'm going to lose that my job. I'm going to run away. I'm, I know I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to lose everything. But I'm going to stand for the Lord because the time is near. I'm looking up because my redemption dried night. Because I could die anyway. I could die at any time anyway. So it's not about compromising and forgetting about God and forsaking the ways of God just so that you can have your job and have your deeds and have the pleasures of this world. Amen? So those people that understand, what would they do? They will instruct many. See, still preparing the way for the Lord. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. Did you see that? God is already saying that the, the saints will be overcome. I know I'm preaching end time here. But, 
But it said to be overcome at that time. Let me just move on. I don't dwell on it. Verse 34. Now, when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. That means people will be saying, oh yeah, we are for you, oh, we stand behind you. But no, they don't, <laughs> they don't want to suffer what you're suffering. Anyway, let's move on. Verse 35, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed. So what I wanted to bring out from this is, See, you might be going through persecution, you might be going through hard times or different things, but God is doing this to try you. So, life was going smooth. Next thing, you started going to the right church. Right? You got saved. You started going to the right church. You started reading the right Bible. God wants to try you. Are you doing all this just because of the bread? That he fed you with, you know, the thousand loaves of bread. And Oh, are you doing all this because life is smooth? How about your family deserts you? Right? How about evil things start happening to you? Your car breaks down on the road. Your business, something's wrong with your, your job or your business or something. How, if those things happen, what is going on? God is saying, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them. That means, you know, they'll be overcome. To try them. God is trying to try them. God is trying to purge them. Purge. Remember, he, he would prune the tree so it would bear forth more fruits. He wants to purge out the things that you don't need in your life. So you're going through persecution because he's purging you out. Just to make you better. To purge them and to make them white. God is cleaning your life up. Because you, you, become, you join a church, you start working for God, you start doing great things. Or church, this new church that we just started, we're doing all these great things for the Lord. See, if evil things come your way, just remember, you, it doesn't mean you're insane. It doesn't mean you did something wrong. It happened to Job. <laughs> right? But God wants to purge you, make you clean. So you, you dive, delve more, get more into the Lord. Say, God, see, uh, he gives and he takes away. Glory be to God. How does how, that verse go again? God giveth and God taketh away. He take all the glory to him. Amen. That's what Job said. So you say, God, I'm more into you. If you want to kill me, then I'll die. Yeah? If I'm going to lose everything, then I've lost everything. Because your grace is sufficient for me. And my only reasonable service is to work for God, is to present myself a living sacrifice to the Lord. So let's prepare the way for the Lord. Open to Malachi chapter 3. Let's go back to Malachi. Malachi chapter 3. Then again, open to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So just hold that. Let's go back to Malachi. Look at chapter, uh, chapter 3 from verse 1. Malachi chapter 3 from verse 1. The Bible says, and, oh, sorry, Malachi chapter 3. <laughs> Bible says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, said the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? So, I, I want to point your mind so that you see this as I'm reading it. I want to point your mind to the second coming, the day. All right? Who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit, remember that, sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, precious stones. Remember that. And he shall purify who? The sons of Levi. Who are the sons of Levi? Priests. Who are we? Priests. He shall purify who? The sons of Levi and purge them as what? Gold and silver. I mean, look at, look at the rhymes in the Bible. The sons of Levi purge them as gold and silver. That they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. And I will come near, <laughs> and I will come near to you to judgment, to judgment. Do you see that? 
And I will, I will, be, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adult, uh, adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages and uh, the widow the fa and the fatherless and that turn aside the stranger from his right and, and fear not me, said the Lord of hosts, for I am the Lord, I change not, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. So every time you say Jesus is Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, you should be saying, God, thank you, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because they say, oh, Jesus in the Old Testament, he was destroying everybody, right? Now in the New Testament, oh, his, his grace. God is saying, it's because I have not changed, that's why you're not destroyed. Right. <laughs> that means in the Old Testament, he was very merciful. <laughs> Did you see the logic? I mean, people are just backwards with the Bible. So because God doesn't change, you're not dead. But if he had changed, he, his message would just be taken out because to whom much is given, much is required. But he's so merciful. That's why you're not destroyed. But that's the last. So if you read through this, I was trying to bring your, those that understand what I'm trying to say in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You see that God here is talking about uh, I mean, uh, a prophecy also is manifold wisdom. Yes, prophecy of the first coming, but you can see the second coming. In the second coming, there's going to be the judgment seat of Christ. It's someone on his own. I, I need to round up. But judgment seat of Christ, God says he will sit as a refiner's fire. What is he purging out? The gold, the silver. Because the wood here is stubble, there's nothing to purge out. As soon as he reaches the fire, it's dust. <laughs> so he's purging the gold. And who is he doing that for? The Levites. Who is he doing that for? The priest. You are a royal priesthood. So he's coming to judge us. This is the second coming. This is the judgment seat of Christ. God is saying, go and prepare the way. Use your voice. Prepare the way. I told you open 1 Corinthians 3. I'll just read it for you. And we'll close. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. The Bible says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, see, mention those two. Then he said, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is if any man's work abide which he had built thereupon he shall receive a reward if any man's work shall be burned he shall suffer loss but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire so that's what God's talking about that's second coming it's going to be judgment seat and all of that so but before that what precedes that behold I will send my messenger he shall prepare the way before me the voice speaking in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way for the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you because you're a wonderful God. Thank you for the church. Thank you, uh, you know, we, we got our hearing approved. Thank you for everything you do in our lives, personally, um, our families here. We, we, we just thank you, Lord. But yeah, many of us are going through hard times, different things, but I pray, Lord, you continue to encourage us, see us through this period, uh, make a way for us where there seems to be no way. And I pray more importantly, O oh Lord, that we will be messengers for you preparing the way for you to do your work starting with us because judgment begins in the house of the lord so starting with us prepare, let's prepare your way to do your work here with us then we can move it outside so you prepare your way to do your work here in our community they've accepted us so you're working in our community and even to the utmost parts of the world just moving out from there i pray lord that you will use us mightily and you you make us you uh, help us to yield to your spirit oh lord and fill us up with your spirit oh lord let's Spirit of God come upon us, uh, bolden us, O Lord, in Jesus' name. As we go, go with us, be with us, preserve us, keep us, O Lord, and um, uh, bless our bands, bless the works of our hands, give us power to make wealth, O Lord, in Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen.